I met um, a bit of living history, living proof that history is family history. Uh, an elderly, elderly man and woman on vacation, actually to meet some family they'd never met before here in Parksville, all the way from the UK. The woman, Frances, lives at Whitford in Hertfordshire, which is a village parish, I think, of about 500 in population, where she tends a fount that her 17th great-grandfather was baptized in and who squired the line, a family line, that actually helped found Harvard University in the United States. She is an historian. She is a clearly a vocational uh, what do you call that? Parson, I would say. Since she lives in somewhat of a parsonage. And very, uh, two very peaceful, grounded uh, people walking in bare feet down at the seashore. And that's what got us talking because I talked about the movie Earthing and about how important it is to ground to the earth. And the gentleman had a couple very interesting stories. He met a shepherd in uh, the hills of Scotland. And at first he thought he was drunk. And he realized upon deeper reflection, as he acclimatized to the natural rhythms around you, that the shepherd was actually just a very thoughtful person uh, who was living a different rhythm of life. It seemed drunk to him. I wonder in a sense if we're drunk compared to that shepherd. He spent several days in the cold trying to trace where the deer made it over a certain ridge. It took him two days sitting on a, on a log until finally the deer finally showed up and showed him just how they made their way. And um, it's amazing how inhospitable and disorienting nature can be and is assumed to be by those who are so disoriented and in many ways disoriented from and in many ways inhospitable to nature and thus to ourselves. Much as taking your own car apart would be inhospitable to your ability to travel. Right? As though cars were never meant to take you anywhere unless you took them apart. This is something of the, the mental problem that besets us. And... We all have our stories, and they are important. So this is for Francis and Bruce, who are meeting children in a family history that has been recently resurrected through genealogy, and a father whose honor has been cleared by the vicissitudes of the living memory he has left behind him. I find it astounding how many incredibly loud sounds will interrupt your thought when anywhere near these things called roads. If you ever read Watership Down by... Um, oh, his name will come to me. Watership Down. His name will come... Anyway, the novel called Watership Down see how the animals treat roads. They're very curious as to these things, these straight lines of death that we lay down upon the earth. I highly recommend Watership Down, by the way. He wrote more than one book chronicling the adventures of these rab rabbits. Rab Scuttle being one of them, a, sort of a, a mythical figure among the rabbits themselves. I'm going to have to look up that author and tell you who it is. I really should know. I divulged to my mother the other day some of the evidence of a flat earth. I divulged to my shaman friend the day before that the evidence of a flat earth, and both of them, my mother with a little prodding, took it quite well. It is a daunting prospect. 
and I must say a most pleasing one. It answers the question, where did the sun go? Where did the sun of our mind that seems to be so noticeable by its absence, though its disappearance and our enlightenment have somehow been conflated in its absence, for the sake of its absence, and the progress that seems to be alloyed with it, <laughs> and I'm sorry, it is a bit humorous and deadly, as the case may be. I'm not pointing the camera in any particular direction. I have to say that a city does not afford so many beautiful prospects as does 21 acres of undeveloped land. family history, honesty. It's hard to be honest. The, some of the Indian history and science traces a complete psychology of life and a total science of human creative intelligence, of the conception and reach of thought. That of the root, seed, and fruit of the place of human thought in the eternal and temporal phases of creation, the unbounded and the bound, the unchanging self that changes everything in terms of ourselves and everyone else on earth. An ounce of inspiration is worth a pound of cure, Napoleon himself said, that the right thought at the right time can turn the tide of a war in your favor. How much war, how much more so our entire life. All information and intelligence offers us choices. We all have rites of passage that offers us choices to be honest to ourselves, to betray ourselves, to betray the sometimes unhealthy confidences and trusts of others what to honor them what to honor and what to betray when people are attached to a round earth or any belief for whatever reason and there are always good ones every emotional attachment has a good reason doesn't mean the emotional attachment is reasonable then you stand to betray people. They stand to get their hackles up. They stand to resort to more fallacious or bigoted behavior. The very same behavior they will quite often accuse you of. An attack never registers as a positive thing for anyone. I've been there. I've been on both sides. But reasonable arguments should hold a significant amount of sway. And when they don't, then... The focus needs shift to properly attending to holding people morally accountable with understanding for the terrible distress, conscious or not, that funds not only irrational behavior, but the ones of words that are so often waved over or around rational behavior in order to make it a rational proposition, exclusive to what in all of the respects of the reasonable objections of others. When someone cannot reasonably object to your ideas or beliefs or any of the proponents of them, as though attacking them personally, then you're absolving the truth of critical scrutiny, and you're depriving it of critical scrutiny. And if it's because it's a woman, you're actually committing misogyny. If it's a man, misandry. If it's both, racism. In fact, all racism and all war is predicated upon absolving people of their agency. Robbing them of it, even, for the sake of one's safety. Another version of the cybernetic algorithm. To absolve one of agency in order to give them more power in the world. 
feminism is a perfect articulation of this form of the cybernetic algorithm and its corresponding psychosis, protected as though the safety of women from what constitutes the rape of any objection to the contrary. Serious stuff. Bombs are dropped because of the fund of such deviations in reason and feeling, and the coordination of both by the fount of the unbounded strata of existence, we have lost to our infinite cost, and reclaim and resurrect like the sun of the flat earth or of the full value of our needed communication, coordination, and correspondence among ourselves, lands, people, heaven and earth, our food, our truth, our beauty, our self-worth by birth. We resurrect with a greater thoughtfulness that pays us an infinite kind. We, we owe ourselves that experience. Understanding is work, and there's no one to blame for that but ourselves. It's our responsibility, and ultimately it is all our vocation, wherever and whenever we may live. Casting our purest thoughts for the sake of our ancestors and our descendants forever. Interesting thoughts from the pale. Thoughts from the pale while waiting for the bus. If anyone wonders, I'm feeling a lot better about the harassment I suffered recently. A little more understanding, a little more appreciation, a little more wisdom. Maybe a few hairs on my otherwise very bare chest. My nose probably a little bigger. My ears a little floppier. My hair a little blonder. My back a little more sore. What with the weight of the world upon my shoulders. Or is our burden light? Should we lay down our burden in the biblical sense? Should we inherit the destiny of Methuselah and live to a ripe old age under the aegis of our birth yes from Emerson to the Bhagavad Gita we have a complete psychology of life and a complete science of thought that is something that comes quite natural to a child immersed as much in the unbounded strata of existence as in the son of their own mother and father and selves an infinite correspondence as familiar as that of a mother to a child. Sound good? That's the motherland I lay claim to. That's the honor I seek to temper with the object of a love and a science truly worthy of the infinite life to which we aspire and with which alone we aspire if we hope to gain even a smattering of acquaintance with it. Healing indeed. Relief indeed, peace indeed. It's always around us. There is power in everything. As my Celtic ancestors would have said, power in everything. Power and beauty and kindness. Life and virtue and happiness. A trifecta of truly terrestrial and celestial intelligence. The cultural biology of heaven and earth. must needs bend and medicate the constraints to which we've become accustomed, as though for the sake of communication, the destruction as though for the sake of creation and salvation. Our body knows when we are ready, the rest and the relief is there, often in the form of our greatest suffering or fears come true. So do the wisdom of our ancestors come to us in the night, and like the night, and from the night the dawn of that sun that is to us a self as familiar as our place of birth, and of that living history that dwells and on the wind, and on the lips of birds, and on all our lips. The language that funds the very foundations of the world and the realization in life of every destiny and wonder with which a child aspires in the ages of their family and their birth 
and the resuscitation and resurrection of the sun of that proper coordination of soul and body, of honor and trust, whose rays are admitted by the clouds of every predatory delusion we have come to find so indispensable, deprived of the conditions that are sufficient, not only for a child, but for the joy and love that inspires every romance on earth, that of the science and art and way of life, of the continuity of home and the commemoration of the birth and destiny of human thought and action that funds every measure and rhythm and image of heaven and earth and of the filaments of our own minds memories of a bliss within and beyond all bounds of space, time and causation. This is my poem to you today. A blessing, hopefully carried on the wind of God's own desire. A perfect hieroglyph, as Whitman would it say, saying the broad spaces and the open spaces. These great tufts of everlasting life, such as the fund of our psychology and the entire living creation of every organ of the birth and seed and fruit of our thought from root to a truly human existence. God bless, be safe, and blessed be.